The 31st of May 1809 marks one of the most significant days in the biography of the world famous Austrian composer Joseph Haydn, because on that day, at about 12.40 in the afternoon in his house in Gumpendorf, he died at the age of 77. He had been suffering greatly from an undiagnosed illness for years and had already stopped composing in 1803. Unfortunately for him, although I doubt he cared too much at this point, Vienna was occupied by French forces, a circumstance that only allowed for a simple funeral at the Hundsturm graveyard with only a handful of people present. Haydn's last patron, Nikolaus II from the renowned Easterhase family, swore that he would transfer the body to Eisenstadt and even obtained a permit to do so. But times were challenging. The Napoleonic Wars, the Vienna Congress, all these talks with diplomats and all other immensely debilitating activities your average Hungarian nobleman had to go through simply made him forget about that promise for 11 years. It was only in 1820 when Prince Adolphus, Duke of Cambridge, a passionate lover of Haydn's works, said the following toast during a banquet hosted by Nikolaus in Eisenstadt. How fortunate is the man who possessed this Haydn in life and is still in possession of his earthly remains. Nikolaus just barely managed to stay calm and make everyone believe that he indeed owns the composer's remains. On the next day he promptly ordered that the body be exhumed and moved to its proper place. His entire reputation was at stake. No one should find out how carelessly he dealt with that corpse. The prince was present when the coffin was open and to his shock, someone had been quicker. The corpse was still there but the head was missing. The only thing they found was a wig which the grave robbers kindly left. Outraged he contacted the Viennese police who were particularly famous for their efficiency. It didn't take them very long to obtain the first clue. Two weeks after the investigation had begun, the police talked to a pharmacist called Joseph Schwinner, who told them that he had seen such a skull on a visit to local prison governor named Johann Nepe McPeter ten years prior. Apparently Mr. Peter made no effort whatsoever to conceal the fact that said skull was Haydn's, he even mentioned it every time Schwinner saw it. The next day the police paid Johann Peter a visit. He managed to remain calm and explained that he had received the skull from an old friend called Dr. Leopold Eckhart, who worked at the Vienna General Hospital. However, a certain Joseph Karl Rosenbaum, who was a former secretary of the Esterhazy family and also a close friend of Haydn's, failed to verify that the skull was actually real. Peter then disappointedly handed the skull over to Rosenbaum. That had happened a few years ago. Now, following the news of the investigation, Peter asked Rosenbaum to return the head yet again so that he could hand it over to the police, which he also did. Still a bit on the sceptical side, the police met with Rosenbaum himself, a man who enjoyed an exceptionally high social standing. He told them the exact same story and reaffirmed everything Peter had said. Sadly, the police couldn't question Dr. Leopold Eckhart on why he had stolen the skull and what he needed it for, because he was deceased. Not that this was necessary because both Mr. Peter and Mr. Rosenbaum were liars. Let's go back to the early summer of 1809. A mere three days after Haydn was put to rest, Rosenbaum himself bribed the grave digger to break into the graveyard and steal the head. He then personally met up with the grave digger to pick up his newly acquired prestige object. Because of the hot temperatures outside, the head had already started to decompose and turn green, which caused Rosenbaum to throw up. He and his friend Peter subsequently transported the head to the General Hospital in Vienna, where they dissected it for a good hour. According to his diary, it was the massive brain that smelled the worst. During this procedure, the head was macerated and the skull bleached. But why go through this effort? What possible use could this nauseating act have had? Both Rosenbaum and Peter were passionate followers of the School of Phrenology. The idea behind this now discredited pseudoscience was that bumps on a person's skull would determine the personality and character of this individual. This theory was invented by German physician Franz Joseph Gall in 18th century Vienna. He observed that the human cerebral cortex was much larger than that of animals, which caused him to believe that this is what made humans intellectually superior. He then went on to conclude that the physical features of the cortex could be observed on the shape of the skull. To enforce his theory, he examined the skulls of young pickpockets and found a number of bumps above their heads. According to him, this was a sign that a person had the tendency to steal or hoard valuable objects. He went around prisons, asylums and hospitals around the city and measured every head he was allowed to. After many long years of research, he compiled a system of 27 so-called faculties. 
each of which corresponded with one particular area of the brain. This area here, for instance, must be incredibly well developed within me. And this explains why I have this odd dent at the upper back of my head. So, to summarise it all, every person is born with their moral character and intelligence, a factor which they cannot change. During his lifetime, Gull already saw himself confronted with a massive number of people who questioned his methods, and even put forth evidence to counteract his ridiculous claims. Gull simply chose to ignore all of this, and so did many people in the following decades. Having your head examined by a phrenologist remained a popular thing to do even in the Victorian era. Now, it should hardly come as a surprise that the head of this musical genius must have been incredibly interesting for phrenologists such as Rosenbaum and Peter, who were all too eager to examine Haydn's attributes. Indeed, they found that Haydn's skull was actually fully developed. After the examination, Peter kept this artifact in a wooden ornament. As you might have guessed already, this skull Peter handed over to the police was not the real deal, but instead belonged to a young man who died in his 20s. Furious, the police returned to Rosenbaum's property and demand that they be allowed to thoroughly search it. After many hours of searching, they found nothing of interest, and that's because Rosenbaum's wife was in on the plot. She hid the skull in her mattress, lay on it, and pretended to be menstruating. The police considered it too much trouble to ask the lady to stand up, and so they left. For Nikolaus II, the matter was everything but finished. He still feared that this incident would escalate into a massive scandal and therefore decided to bribe Rosenbaum. And because old tricks work best, Rosenbaum handed Nikolaus a skull belonging to some old man. Nikolaus believed him and returned to Eisenstadt, where he returned the skull in complete secrecy to what he believed to be his proper grave. Joseph Karl Rosenbaum clung on to Haydn's skull until his death in 1829. On his deathbed, he gifted the skull to his old friend Johann Nepomuk Peter, whose widow would later donate it to a doctor named Karl Huller. In 1852, Huller delivered the skull to one of Vienna's most famous pathologists, Professor Karl von Rokitansky, who then kept it at the Pathological Anatomical Institute of the University. The Viennese Society of the Friends of Music acquired the skull through Rokitansky's sons, where it remained until the 1950s. It was only on the 5th of June 1954, 145 years after his death, when Haydn's skull was finally reunified with his body at the Birkkirchen Eisenstadt, where it hopefully remains to this day. <laughs>